Hello there, my friends. Chris Marcus here with you for another episode of Inside the Markets. And as you can see, I have a very exciting guest over there today, Professor Lawrence Kotlikoff, a professor of economics at Boston University, who has, in addition to having a fascinating life, done a lot of great research, many of which I cite from time to time. So it's great to have you on the show, Professor, and thanks for joining us. How are you today, my friend? Um, great. It's, um, I'm up here in Vermont, my cottage, and uh, uh, nice and snowy. I don't know if you can, everybody can see, but there's snow outside, and uh, it's winter here in New England. <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, I, I, you know, I just, I, seem to be doing better than uh, certain portions of the U.S. economy, which I've been excited to dig in with you for a while, so... To start things off, again, something that I wish everybody in the planet knew, especially to everyone in the investment world, and you've done a great job of spreading in the sense that we're told we have about $20, $21 trillion of publicly outstanding debt, yet what is often missed is the cost of these un unfunded liability programs like Social Security and Medicare. So if right. you could give us an update of where that stands, I think that'd be great to start off with. Sure. I, I think the, um, the first thing that people need to understand is that these official numbers, like the 21 trillion that you just cited, they're completely uh, bogus. They're bogus. Uh, if I told you exactly what time of the day, you know, exactly what time it was here in, uh, in my uh, cottage up in Vermont, or exactly the length of this table that uh, the laptop is sitting on, I would be giving you bogus information if I said this is exactly the answer because we know from uh, the theory of relativity that there's not a single time uh, that it is right now. There's not a single distance of this table that it all depends on your language, which uh, in, in the context of physics is your, um, your direction and speed through space. So if you're going this way through space at a certain speed, you're going to uh, measure time, you're going to say the time right now is a different time than I'll say, because I'm not moving through space at the same direction, the same speed. So uh, any, I think, physicist would say that if I were to actually pound the table and say, this is the time, this is the absolute time, and this is the absolute distance, they would say, I'm 100 years out of date in terms of, of um, knowledge of physics. Uh, and they would be right. There's not actually one measure of time and, and, and distance. There's actually an infinite number. And it's actually the same thing with the deficit and the debt. So you measured it as $21 trillion. You used a certain language, a certain frame of reference. You know, the, the guy's moving through space and at this speed, he's got a frame of reference and that's really his language, if you like. But uh, you're using a certain set of uh, ways to label government receipts and payments. That's your frame of reference. That, that's your language. It's like using French versus English. And so you have, uh, and I speak, when I say you, I mean really the U.S. government has been using a certain set of words to historically label all the receipts and all the outlays it's been making. And uh, so it's come up with this number 21 trillion, but if it used different words, to describe its receipts, and different words to describe its outlays historically, we could have a number that wasn't 21 trillion, but was negative 250 trillion. Uh, uh, or, or it could be positive uh, 10 zillion. Uh, now, how do I, what's the language problem here? Well, uh, so Chris, if I'm Uncle Sam and I'm coming to you this year and taking, let's say $20,000 from you, I can say that I'm borrowing the money from you and maybe I promise to make you some payment of 50,000 in the future. So I could say, well, look, I'm gonna borrow 20,000. In, uh, in 10 years when I owe you 50,000, I'm gonna give you uh, 30,000 back, so that's principal plus interest. And then the rest, the other 20, I'm gonna make a transfer payment. That's one set of words, borrowing, uh, repayment of principal plus interest plus a transfer payment. Here's another set of words. I could say that I'm taxing you 20,000, not borrowing 20,000 from you. I'm taxing you 20,000. And uh, in the future, I'm going to pay you 50,000 as a transfer payment. So 
Now I've switched my words. So if I use the first set of words, I'm saying I'm borrowing 20,000. So we're going to add 20,000 to the official debt. That 21 trillion number is going to be 21 trillion plus 20,000. Right. Bigger. And if I use this other set of words. Now you don't really give a damn because you're having to hand over 20,000 now. You're handing over 20,000. And you're going to get back fifty thousand. Uh, you're going to get some number back. It could even, it could be negative. It doesn't. The language is so flexible here. It doesn't matter really what these numbers are. You could be getting nothing back in the future, and I could uh, change. The, I could say that I'm taxing you now, uh, making a transfer payment to you in the future, but um, borrowing from you in the future, so that you end up with nothing. Uh, so. So really the language uh, produce, uh, permits us to report an infinite number of official debts and deficits for right now. Uh, the deficit is, is the change in the debt. So the, the debt is a stock of all the, the accumulation of all these past deficits. So if I use one set of words historically, I'm Uncle Sam, I could use one set of labels, I can get this number for today. If I use a different set of, number of words, I'll get a different number. And anybody in this country, uh, um, until the president uh, decides what we should say, which that he'd like us to, to say exactly what he would like us to say. Uh, and mostly it's uh, uh, your God and uh, we're, we're awful. We're, you know, we're, we're ants and you're God and, and pray, bow down to him. That's what he'd like to do to have us do. But short of that happening, we are free Americans to use whatever language we want. So the fact that Uncle Sam is using some stupid ling lingo that's not well-defined doesn't mean we can't use some other stupid language that's also not well-defined because when I say not well-defined, if we can end up with a zillion different measures of the official debt today, you say it's 21 trillion, I say it's 52 trillion, uh, the number is meaningless. That's why they're all stupid. All these sets of words, uh, all these measurements are stupid. So what economics says is that you have to come up with a measure which is language free. And that means, in effect, uh, and you have to put everything on the books. Another way to understand what's been going on is that we, by using the language that they have, uh, Congress and successive administrations, not just this one, but all in the past, have been keeping things off the books. They've been intentionally calling certain things uh, taxes and certain things, you know, for example, Social Security. I'm taking, I'm Uncle Sam, I'm taking money from you. I could call it borrowing and call your future Social Security benefits uh, a transfer, a, a repayment of principal plus interest, but I'm calling it taxation and future transfer payments. And by using that language, I'm keeping the amount of money, uh, the FICA tax payments uh, that come with an obligation to pay you in the future, I'm keeping that future obligation off the books just by the choice of words, okay? It's that simple. Uh, nobody in the world gets this with the exception of a handful of economists who then, uh, well, not a handful, I think most economists probably get it since I've been hammering it for so, ye so many years, like 30 years or so, but they don't talk about it because everybody's talking about the debt, just like you started the conversation, as if that was a real number, as if it wasn't a phony number. Uh, so... Here's the problem. So the problem is that we're, t we're trying to driving in New York City with a map of Los Angeles right. and we're ending up in the East River. If you put everything on the table together, if you do the thing that economics says, uh, make a lang language free measure and you do it this way, you just take the whole path of projected outlays, no matter what they're called, and all the projected uh, receipts and you take the present value of each stream and you go out to infinity, you take these streams out to infinity, but you present value them. So numbers way out in the future don't have that big a value today in the present. So you take the present value of the outlays, subtract the present value of the receipts. That's the fiscal gap. That's about 200 trillion. So the true indebtedness of our country is about 10 times larger than the official debt. Right. And so the country's in, in, is bankrupt, uh, entirely bankrupt. And what we need is about a 50% increase in every single federal tax. The whole path of revenues has to be 50% higher to pay for all the outlays that we are obligated. The, this is all based on CBO, Congressional Budget Office projections. I'm not making up these numbers. 
And this fiscal gap analysis has been endorsed by 20 Nobel Prize winners, and uh, it's been done in many, many countries around the world, 30 or so, 40 countries, and it's been done by the IMF, the World Bank. Uh, so there's no question that this is what economics says to do. And there's no question that economic theory says, uh, in terms of mathematics, that this number that we're talking about, the 21 trillion, is not well defined. In other words, any economic model, you can write down in mathematical terms, does not tell you, and you can have all kinds of problems in that economy you're describing, you know, uh, people have incomplete information, markets aren't complete, people are credit constrained, uh, there's uh, uh, all kinds of issues that can arise, uh, moral hazard, a asymmetric in, uh, information. So regardless, if, if the agents are rational, you still have this fundamental language problem that you can still relabel the government's, uh, the government's actual uh, receipts and outlays in a way to produce any time path of deficits you want, including negative ones, up and down, high or low, negative, positive, whatever you want, you can make just by choice of words. That's a mathematical proof. There's an article on my website, kotlikoff.net, with uh, Jerry Green, who's a professor, at, uh, a theorist at uh, Harvard, the senior theorist in the sense of the oldest, but also extremely well uh, respected top theorist in the, one of the top theorists in the country. This is not uh, Einstein's uh, theory of relativity. It's not as important, but in economics, it's very much the same story. Einstein showed that the math of physics does not define time and distance. The math of economics does not define the deficit or the debt. Right. And so we have to have measures that are language free and then once you do the fiscal gap accounting, no matter what uh, language you're using, what labeling you're using, as long as you're internally consistent, if I say that I'm uh, borrowing money from you, then I have to also talk about making a repayment of principal plus interest in the future. Uh, as long as you're internally consistent, you will have um, the same fiscal gap. So. That's just like space, time, and physics. There's a concept called, I don't know any physics really, but my understanding is there's this concept of uh, space time, which is well-defined, which is in, a, in effect uh, free of the, of the reference uh, uh, language, uh, reference uh, framework that you're traveling through space with. So I hope you get this bigger point that there's a deep problem in economics that we're using the, uh, and in the world at large that we're using meaningless numbers to think about the actual economy. So I just, you know, uh, looked at some slides from uh, the chief economist of the IMF just yesterday, uh, Mari Opsfeld. He's a good friend of mine. He's a great economist, brilliant. Uh, but he's talking about, we're talking about Chile's deficit because he's going to go to a, I'm organizing a conference in Chile to talk about the Chilean uh, economy and he's presenting slides about their debt right. and so the message is has not uh it's gone across but uh when you have everybody else talking about the wrong numbers you start it's the emperor's new clothes you know that story right mm -hmm. so you can't call the emperor naked if everybody's saying he's uh, got beautiful clothes because you'll be arrested and thrown in jail whatever um uh, or you'll you <laughs> It's funny you mentioned that. I've actually been working on a book proposal with the working title being The Emperor is Really Naked because like you point out, it's, it's the numbers are simple, but it's really, it's just so shocking that I think most people can't believe it's gotten that out of hand. I think people see the government spends a lot, do a lot of things with the military yet. <clears throat> and for people who think that the $200 trillion number you mentioned sounds shocking, like you pointed out, I remember seeing the CBO, Congressional Budget Office, um, they had an estimate, this was five or six years ago, of even $85 trillion, which it's obviously grown since then, and I assume often the government numbers are generous <laughs> in their assumptions. Although one question I had for you, it's been a while since I took my accounting classes in undergrad or business school, but... The way that Congress is accounting for this, isn't that in direct violation of the gap generally accepted accounting principles? I mean, it's 
it seems to me that they brought Enron in front of Congress for what they did, which was certainly, you know, not a good thing. Yet, am I missing, or is that uh, is that comparison valid? I don't know. I don't think the gap accounting. Uh, the accountants come up with this account, these accounting frameworks with no connection to a fundamental economic question. If you're trying to understand, the fundamental question here is how big, uh, uh, how much uh, uh, of a fiscal burden will have to be paid by somebody in order for the country not to be able to uh, uh, consume what it wants to, cons what it hopes to consume. Because when the government has these uh, a fiscal gap, it's in effect saying that telling people, well, look, you guys are going to get to consume uh, more because we're not going to hit you up with more uh, receipts that, that uh, we're not going to pay you back. And we're going to let you consume and everybody else in the future. And uh, even though we don't have the resources to do it. So that's the real question. What, what are we short as a country in paying for our bills through time? That's the key question underlying the fiscal gap. That's uh, comes right out of economics. You know, any economic model of growth has something called the intertemporal budget constraint. It's a, re a, 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 re a uh, condition that the economy has to, in present value, cover all its outlay, that, that the government has to cover all its outlays in present value via receipts. It can have a free ride. There's no free lunch. Right. And the gap accounting, the conventional uh, fiscal deficit accounting, none of it connects to, uh, accountants are off doing their uh, stupid things by themselves without any context. context. Uh, I really have to say that it's, it's, it's just meaningless accounting because it doesn't connect to, to something that's uh, language free. It should not be the case that our fiscal affairs uh, are understood differently if we speak in Swahili versus Russian, right? That's exactly, that's the situation. We're talking in Swahili and we're getting a very different picture than if we were talking in Russian. And there's actually a, a, a picture that's independent of what language, we'll come out with the same answer no matter what language you use. And we're not using that, that analysis, even though I've been writing about this since 1986, I wrote the first paper here uh, on this subject called the De deficit delusion. And the people that uh, paid attention were not the economists because economists are deeply vested in using the wrong line in misleading people with the wrong language because they've been doing that for years and they don't want to undo everything they've been saying for years. Okay. That's very embarrassing. So, uh, so they don't, so they just keep at it. They are the tailors of the emperor's new clothes uh, story. And the people that paid any attention to this uh, were actually scientists. So I was invited to write an article for Science Magazine after this first article came out called Deficit Delusion. It's on my website, kotlikop.net, came out in the public interest. It was a journal uh, that um, public, you know, kind of public policy journal that uh, a lot of people read back then. And uh, it was Irving Crystal, William Crystal's, uh, the Republican uh, pundit, uh, political pundit, his dad had this uh, publication. And then when his dad went past, I think it stopped. But anyway, Science Magazine said, write, me, write us an article about this. So the scientists were interested because they could see the parallel with, uh, I believe, with relativity. And, um, and then I've written co-authored books on fiscal gap analysis uh, with lots of people in different regions and countries. Just recently in El Salvador with, uh, via UNICEF uh, and also in Russia recently, a couple of years ago. So, but it's not become the mainstream. Uh, Norway took this fiscal gap analysis right, quite seriously. And I believe it was the reason that they set up their, uh, their pension fund, which is now it's basically a sovereign fund that has about a trillion dollars of assets. And it's, I think, the largest sovereign fund, fund in the world because we did the analysis for uh, Norway and we showed, well, look, you've got a, not, not a, an official deficit, you've got an official surplus. You've got a big, you don't have any debt. You've got, back in 1992 or so, or four, you've got a huge surplus, a lot of government wealth. 
but you're broke. And why were they broke? Because their, their North Sea oil, which was generating uh, the stream of receipts, was slated to uh, <clears throat> stop at some point. And, and it's petering out because there was a fixed amount of oil in the North Sea and everybody knew it, but they're spending, their, their outlays were far and above the receipts. So it was clear that uh, they were on a path to uh, immiserate their children, to leave huge bills for their kids. And when that became clear in the uh, finance ministry in, in uh, Norway started to do the analysis on their own, then we, uh, they moved to uh, setting up, set, taking some of those North Sea uh, revenues and setting them aside as a trust fund. So that's an example where fiscal gap accounting and generational accounting, thinking about the implications for the next generation of this problem, that all uh, had a really big and very good impact. Yeah, it's, it's incredible. You see it around the globe certainly in the U.S. and I'm curious how you see this all playing out where it almost feels to me as if we have to on some level be headed towards some sort of reset where the numbers are so big. What do you see as the way this gets resolved? Well, this is like a slowly growing cancer and uh, that uh, you don't, you operate a little bit on it at a time and every time you reoperate, it's a bigger cancer because you, you didn't take care of it uh, at the time, last time you operated. And it eventually kills the patient. So if you look at Argentina back in 1910, they were the fifth highest per capita GDP country in the world. And today they're a developing country again because they have spent a year engaged in, uh, a century engaged in uh, expropriating young people to the benefit of old people. This is all connected to taking from young people, promising them stuff that uh, uh, you haven't set aside funds to provide. Uh, using the language of taxes, I'm taxing you money now, I'm gonna pay you Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid benefits in the future. Uh, and don't worry because uh, I'll be able to pay those. But the story is, the real story is I'm going to have to come to your kids and take money from them and give it to you. Uh, and when you start taking uh, more than those kids earn, or if there aren't as many kids, or if they leave the country because there are better opportunities abroad, or you're taxing them, or you're hitting, you're hitting them up for too much, then uh, it's game over. So... When will that happen? Well, it took 100 years. Uh, Argentina is still uh, basically stagnating relative to other countries. So it's taken 100 years for Argentina to uh, hit, the, hit the skids. But uh, people gradually started pulling out of Argentina. We have much less investment there than would otherwise have been over a long, long time. That's what I think uh, could be the prognosis here in the U.S., that you just you don't see necessarily – a critical point, you just see a gradual, uh, uh, the, you know, it may be that the cancer gets big enough to kill an organ, a vital organ, and you're dead. That could happen, and interest rates could shoot up. But, uh, I mean, think about the Social Security system. Uh, just on the books, if you use conventional lingo, in 2031, it's supposed, to, it's going to be, you know, technically insolvent because it's, the trust fund will be a zero and there won't be money to pay the bills and they're talking about cutting benefits by a third. Uh, now, a large fraction of the elderly live, live almost entirely or mostly on Social Security. So this, uh, that could cause uh, people to understand that the country's broke. Uh, why can't our country provide health insurance to everybody? Why can't we adequately fund NASA? Why, why do we have to hire SpaceX or somebody else to do our job or the rent the, rent the Russian vehicles, to pay the Russians to get us up to the space uh, station. Why, why can't we fund the National Science Foundation properly? Why can't we build the stupid wall if it's gonna help? Uh, why can't we afford to pay the five billion or whatever uh, that, uh, that would, would help uh, secure the borders if that's actually uh, the right thing to do in terms of that objective? We, we can't do this in large part because we can't afford it. Right. 
And nobody has really gotten across to the public that the country's broke. No politician has explained to the country. Uh, I thought John Kasich would have the guts to do it because he actually understands this, but he didn't have the guts. And uh, that's a shame, but maybe this time around, if he runs again, uh, maybe you'll run as an independent and you'll actually, uh, rather than talking about Trump's behavior, he'll talk about uh, what's actually happening in the country. Right. And I know you mentioned that you uh, on some level ran for president in 2012 and 2016. Certainly, <laughs> you got my vote. I mean, because like you said, none of them are talking about that. Um, is that something you're still considering doing again or being involved in in some capacity? Well, you know, what I, I ran in 2016 as a uh, a uh, registered writing candidate. It took a big effort. I spent about uh, three months writing a platform, which was about 100, 150 pages, 150 pages with very short, here's the problem. Here's uh, a 10 bullet solution for each of our problems. Social security, banking, uh, healthcare, taxes, education, immigration, you name it. Uh, I also talked about abortion, foreign policy. So I felt that it was incumbent upon one economist at least to say what an economist would do, what e and based on kind of talking with lots of economists, what the economics profession generally has to say about how to fix these problems, including our long-term fiscal pro our fiscal gap problem. How do you get that? How do you get the country solvent again? So, uh, so it took a long time to write that. Then it took a long time to get registered and. Uh, because you have to, Mickey Mouse's vote doesn't get counted uh, uh, formally. So everybody could vote for Mickey Mouse, he wouldn't become president. He has to be registered. But the press was not interested because A, I was a writing candidate, and I didn't think people could remember my name, and B, I didn't have a lot of money. So if I had a billion dollars, then they would have been very interested, no matter whether I had any ideas of what to do or not. So. I did this, I ran, I was one of the five people that could officially have been elected back in 2016. I didn't get elected. Uh, if uh, an opportunity ar arises, if there's a third party, there may be a, uh, there are independent parties out there that are, that are centrist, not crazy, not extreme right, right extreme left. And uh, my understanding is that a third party is a, uh, evolving that's going to combine all the other uh, independent parties into one pretty sizable group and it will try and get on the ballot in 2020 in the presidential ballot and i'm hoping that they can come up with a great candidate who has a deep pocket who can uh, uh, basically take everybody from the center which is probably 80 percent of the electorate and galvanize those people and and uh, we can say goodbye to the Republicans and the Democrats because they've made a total mess of the economy and of our country. And they put up, you know, the fact that they, the best person they can come up with is uh, uh, um, Donald Trump, who's a disgrace to himself and his family and his nation and the world and civilization. Um, I mean, he's just, uh, uh, you know, the best move he could make would be to resign on all scores for he make himself the most happy and, and us everybody else happy and maybe can get a pardon in the process. Um, he should do a plea deal today. And then the other group has people like Hillary Clinton, uh, who uh, uh, no new ideas and uh, not clear that they're into this for anything except uh, ego, self-promotion, and selling more books or whatever. Uh, uh, so. Yeah, we need people that actually uh, understand the problems and want to fix it and care more about their kids than themselves. Yeah, and whether we can get you in the White House as the president or not, certainly uh, I think that for the people who are looking for information, trying to understand these things, you provide great service to the global community in terms of bringing these things to light. Uh, last thing I'd like to ask you about before we wrap up, I know you just recently published a report talking about the difference between the big short narrative and how things really imploded in 2008. Um, and you have a lot of thoughts on the soundness of the banking system, which is not very sound, and I certainly could not agree more. Um, 
So anything you'd like to share about that and perhaps you know, what people can do in response? I've heard you talk about gold and silver and cryptos. Um, so anything about uh, those two items? Well, you know, I'm not a, um, uh, I, I think the economy uh, as demonstrated in 2008 is very unstable and the financial system's unstable and then that makes the economy unstable and which makes the financial system worse because we had a bank run, the banks defunded the banks. It was a run by the banks on the banks and then that led employers who had nothing to do with the financial system to say, well, gee, I'm seeing all these banks crash. I'm hearing uh, all these people talk about the Great Depression. Uh, I'm seeing everybody uh, talking about it at cocktail parties. I've got these employees who I have to pay at the end of the month. I'm going to throw. I'm going to lay off a bunch because I'm worried that somebody else is laying off their employees <clears throat> who are my customers. So I, what I do is I lay off my employees who are those guys' customers. So we have a firing run. I run away from my employees and the other people run against away from their employees and the entire thing melts down. Uh, that's what happened here. So the real question is, was, was there something, uh, was the financial system uh, stable or well-structured and that we just had bad apples running it and now if they're chastised and disciplined and supervised, everything will be just fine. That's the reigning narrative. We had people working in a uh, absolutely good financial system or basically good financial system who uh, were bad people. They produced uh, terrible subprimes. Subprimes uh, totally dominated the market. Uh, there was uh, people uh, uh, bought houses at ridiculous prices. There was a massive housing uh, price boom. Uh, uh, companies, uh, banks bribed rating companies to like, um, uh, all the you know the different uh, uh, different agencies, S &Ps, yeah, different agencies, uh, Moody's, S and P, to overrate terrible securities. Um, that we had uh, bankers with no skin in the game. Game they were just out to. Uh, uh, they had all their money protected. They weren't then had nothing to lose by uh, gambling at the public's uh, potential loss. Uh, all these narratives, regulators asleep at the wheel, uh, leverage went up dramatically. I'm telling you the story of the, the big short. If you read the book, if you watch the movie, it's all wrong. If you go to the kotlikoff.net, there's an article called The Big Con, which I just uh, posted on Forbes. It also came out in some other venues. A short article, a couple thousand words. You'll see that None of the, uh, these uh, culprits, alleged culprits, were actually guilty. Subprimes were just too small a factor to uh, affect the economy. There was no real housing price bubble. Uh, the bankers had tons of skin in the game. Jimmy Kane, who was the head of Bear Stearns, lost a billion dollars, for example. Uh, the regulators, there was no increase in leverage. Actually, leverage was lower before, it was declining and, and was lower before the great um, recession began than it had been 10 years before. Bear Stearns was less leveraged than it was 10 years before. We had uh, uh, the rating companies rated things properly on, in general because the, the subprimes um, and these derivatives uh, that they rated highly as AAA actually turned out to be AAA. They outperformed bonds that uh, were rated AAA. So there's no evidence whatsoever supporting any of the, st any of the um, uh, uh, standard uh, stories that were propagated in this propaganda movie, The Big, the big Short. It wasn't, pro I don't think that Michael Lewis intentionally tried to sp sp spew propaganda. I think he's probably a terrific person and uh, he, he just got the wrong idea of understanding because he never looked at the numbers, the facts. And the numbers have just been coming out gradually by economists. And I started to see all these facts that connected with what I observed, like you observed, back in 2008 when Lehman Brothers, when Bear Stearns went from $70 a share, or so 60, 70, one week to $2 the next week, that's got nothing to do with fundamentals. That's got everything to do with opacity. Nobody knows what Bear's got, what Bear actually owns or owes, and everything to do with the fact that it's leverage and nobody knows really what the leverage is. Or the, also the leverage is endogenous. It's not, 
like uh, you know if the if the assets that bears um, owns drop in value because everybody's running on bear, then all of a sudden becomes much more leveraged at the last minute. So what we need is a banking system that can never fail, and the way that you do that is to set up a banking system that has uh, zero leverage and full disclosure. That's called limited purpose banking. And it's very simple how to do it. And it's already in place in a, to a large extent. We just convert every financial corporation into a 100% equity financed mutual fund company. So if you look at the equity financed mutual fund companies, uh, mutual funds like, for example, the Freedom Fund at Fidelity Investments. That's people put in money, they got back shares to the, money, that, the fund, the fund was then invested in stocks. Yes, the stocks went down. Yes, the investors lost money. But the actual middleman, that Freedom Fund, did not go under. Right. It couldn't go under because it didn't owe any, my, anything to anybody. So we can run also derivatives in the same way. We can have a fund. Uh, you could be, uh, Chris, running a fund like a horse track. You uh, set up a fund that's investing in, that's betting on whether or not uh, uh, GM uh, shares go, you know, double over the next year, for example. Uh, and everybody puts their money in. Some people bet on horse A that, that that won't happen, and others bet on horse B that it will happen. You keep all the money right there uh, on reserve with the Federal Reserve. And now, a year later, we find out what happens. And whoever wins gets the pot less the fee in proportion to what they put in. That's the way to run an options market because this is an option on GM shares. People, right? I have an option if the shares go up enough, the price goes up enough to win money, to get more money back. Otherwise I lose. That's an exactly safe way to run a um, derivatives market. Just like <clears throat> if you go back to uh, the horse track racing, goes back to like 1837, they call it paramutual betting. It's a mutual fund. You put your money at the track, and uh, horse A or horse B wins, and the same thing happens. Right. It's derived on their actual horses. It's a derivative right there. That, that bet is derived on the horses or connected to the horse. Horses are actually running the race. So that's a derivative right there. We've never seen a government have to bail out a racetrack, right. a, a race bet. So we can run all of the financial system uh, with absolutely no risk, with no uh, possible um, uh, financial crisis, much more efficiently, full disclosure, much more liquidity. <clears throat> we just have to think beyond, um, you know, two feet. We have to think about how to fix the, the, the problem with the financial crisis, the Great Recession, was not the operators of the system, it was the system. Right. That's the message of the big con. And the reason I call it the big con is that we've been conned to think it was the operators and not the system. We need to fix the system. Dodd-Frank, I'll just leave you with this, uh, Chris. Uh, Bar Barney Frank, who was one of the authors of Dodd-Frank, he was a congressman running the, the House Financial Services Committee. He's a co-author of the Dodd-Frank bill. I sent him my proposal for the uh, uh, limited purpose banking. I wrote a book called Jimmy Stewart is Dead and included that. I sent him copies of the book in 2010, and, uh, or maybe I forget before, I forget exactly the date. Anyway, a couple months after Dodd-Frank has passed, it's in the summer, uh, he called, I get a message that he wants to see me in his office in Cambridge. And I live in the Boston area, so sure, go over to see Bar Barney Frank, I'd seen him before. And you know, anybody knows Barney Frank knows this is not gonna be a fun experience because Barney Frank's gonna yell at you before he says hello. You know, he, he does, you know. Uh, so I walk into Barney's office. <laughs> yeah, I walk there. I sit down. Uh, he's there reading his papers. Does not look, pick his head up to say hello. I just sit there. Twenty minutes later, he's still shuffling his papers. I'm still sitting there, and I say, "Well, uh, uh, Congressman Frank, and uh, great, great to see you. <laughs> Thanks for having me over. Can I? Uh, what would you like to talk about?" So I, inter I interrupted him. Anyway. On his, on his desk is my book, uh, Jimmy Stewart is Dead. And it's called that because Jimmy Stewart was the person in It's a Wonderful Life, the actor in It's a Wonderful Life. And he was able to save the day because it was a great 
uh, a great uh, trustworthy person. And the fact that if we don't have trustworthy people to keep the banking system alive. We can't have a system that's built on trust uh, because trust uh, has taken a holiday. We've got a, a banking system that's set up to fail, that's built to fail, that's unsafe at any speed. Anyway, so Barney uh, finally uh, pays attention and says, I, I noticed you, uh, I say, I noticed you got the book on your desk. And he says, yeah, I read it. Puts his hand on it. It's exactly the right answer. When we go back to uh, Dodd-Frank was a, was a stopgap measure. When I get back to Congress, we're gonna implement this. And he points to it, exactly the way it is. And I said, well, do you have any questions? He said, no. I said, well, great, uh, do I need to say? You want, want to talk about anything? He said, no, thank you, thanks for coming. And that was, that's your typical Barney Frank experience, but now he's working for a bank as a lobbyist or whatever, or a, I don't know, an executive. So, because they got kicked out of Congress, the Democrats, so they were not kicked out of Congress, but they lost the House, and then he lost his position as chairman of the Senate, of the House Financial Services Committee, and then he retired. And so, even Barney Frank was saying this is the solution back within a few months of having passed Dodd-Frank. So, there are answers. We can fix Social Security. We can fix uh, banking. We can fix the tax system, which is really still terrible. In terms of its uh, fairness and efficiency, we can we can fa fix the welfare system. Uh, we can fix the healthcare system. Give everybody a healthcare plan, and and not drive the country broke, and uh, not make it look like England either. In terms of uh, the system, have a competitive, efficient system. So you just need to have economists really uh, running the show. We have no you know it's like we got a bunch of people. Uh, building bridges who are politicians and, and the bridges are collapsing in front of us and we're wondering, well, gee, what happened? Why is it that the bridges are collapsing? Well, we have people that don't have any clue what they're doing. That's, well, yeah. Professor, I really appreciate you sharing that and <laughs> breathing it into Barney Frank's office. Uh, that should be a heroic Nobel Prize for that alone, in my opinion. But really, you're sharing a lot of good information, and uh, I appreciate that, especially that you're, whether you get elected president or not, that you're doing what you can to spread and to raise awareness. Uh, it's unfortunate the way the markets melt down every decade or so, and certainly it seems like we're headed towards something else like that. But fortunately for the people who are interested in staying out of the way of the train and using yeah. Uh, making the best of the situation as it is. You're an incredible resource for that. And perhaps just wrapping up, you could let I just want to, want to say one thing, Chris, relative to the people who are investing in gold and other um, Bitcoins and other mm -hmm. uh, securities. I think being very diversified is a good thing because there's nothing that can keep this financial system from doing exactly what it did in 2008. Right. In many ways, it's riskier. In many, you know, Lehman and Bear Stearns would have passed the stress tests that we're now applying to the banks today, back in 2008, within, even within a couple of days of when they failed. That's according to the SEC chairman at the time. So, so uh, if that's the case, then what we're doing is a charade. You know, these stress tests are meaningless if Bear and Lehman would have passed them back then. And... And so we have a very unstable financial system until we fix it. We can flip from one equilibrium to another, from one state to another uh, very quickly with just a little bit of bad news. And if you look historically at all the financial crises that have led to, great, to different recessions, including 29, uh, the Great Depression, you always see some uh, uh, catalyst, some, some, uh, something that uh, kicked off the recession uh, or depression and it was some financial story about some bank going under or some financial malfeasance or swap land being sold in, in Florida. And something gives people the idea that we got a bunch of crooks running the show and then they all get nervous and they start pulling out together. I'm pulling out because you're pulling out or I think you're pulling out, I'm not gonna take a chance. And then the whole thing melts down and we have short sellers jump on and we had Bear and Lehman were, the, were hit by short sellers. That, they were targeted. 
and we had sequential targeting by financial players because the financial system inherently is built to fail. Right. So, so yeah, you should be diversified. I don't know whether Bitcoin is the answer, but uh, a bunch of different security, whatever way you can diversify is the way to do it. Great. And uh, just wrapping up, how can folks find you so they can keep uh, post that article to yeah. the banking system that we discussed? And well, Kot Kotlikoff, just my last name, Kotlikoff, K-O-T-L-I-K-O-F-F.net. And that's my website. And I post all the articles I write. Um, I do a lot of writing about social security that's on Forbes at Ask Larry. Uh, so if, you, if you're interested in social security uh, uh, advice or suggestions about what, not so much advice, but suggestions about what to do uh, to maximize your social security benefits, you can go there. I have a financial planning software company. Uh, we have a tool. We have a uh, tool called Maxify.com, M-A-X-I-F-I.com. That's really powerful for helping people get a higher living standard without taking any extra risk by, you know, getting higher benefits, lowering their taxes from their 401k withdrawals, etc. So Maxify.com, I think people should look at. Uh, it's getting a lot of. It was written up in the New York Times this summer as the art as the program to run before you start retiring. Think about retiring. So. Uh, so I think, uh, yeah, the, I invite everybody to, to go to kotlikoff.net. All the links to the company and, and, uh, and the articles are all there. So, yeah, take a look. Well, we'll have that down in the description. And again, I just want to thank you for the dedication you've had. I know <laughs> just that you, you dealt with Barney Frank in general. I think it should be a prize for that. But in all, all seriousness, uh, I appreciate the folks like you speak up and let people who are trying to just prepare and uh, be ready for what's coming. So it's a great service, you become a great resource. And thanks again for joining me on the show today. And we'll look forward to catching up with you again soon. Great, my pleasure. You take care.